and welcome to Hospice Insights, The Lawn Beyond, where we connect you to what matters in the ever-changing world of hospice and palliative care. Hospice and Home Health Survey Perspectives, a conversation with Kim Skian, VP of Accreditation at CHAP. Kim, here we are. Thank you for joining me. I feel like we've known each other for a very long time, and now here you are with CHAP. So that was an exciting move that happened. Was it this summer you you moved to CHAP? Absolutely. I, I joined CHAP in May. And yes, we've known each other for many years and in this industry. And I'm really thrilled to be part of the podcast today. Yeah. You know, we've both been around the block and you've been around the block at hospice in lots of different capacities because you're a nurse by training, right? And then, but then you were, weren't you at the Connecticut Hospice Association, Hospice and Home Health? So tell me a little bit about your journey to hospice and then, you know, how you landed here at CHAP. Sure. Well, I am an RN. I have over 30 years in hospice and uh, home health. Uh, uh and with prior experience in oncology. So it's been in my bloodline for virtually my entire nursing career. I now live in Maine, but previously I lived in Connecticut for most of my professional career, where a hospice agency must also be licensed as a home health agency. So oh, in many really? ways, yeah. Ah. So in many ways I was able to work both roles with hospice being my passion. And you're right, I have worked as a clinician, a leader, an educator. I was a clinical instructor for UConn uh, many years ago. Wow. And and most of my experience has been in the areas of compliance, regulatory, and quality in both clinical and administrative roles as a consultant. And yes, as a uh, an exec for the, I was a VP of clinical and regulatory services for the Connecticut Association for Healthcare at Home. My, my work in consulting and the way our paths have crossed over yeah. the years has been up until my move to CHAP has involved the compliance side extensively with government audits, appeals and investigations, as well as operations. And then from a survey perspective, I've worked for many years as a consultant and a state and CMS appointed consultant working with providers related to survey readiness and follow up um, related to plans of, of correction and <laughs> keeping abreast of the seemingly ongoing <laughs> <laughs> regulatory changes over these years. And of course, you and I together are uh, serve on NHPCO's regulatory committee. And also, I also serve on NAC's hospice quality work group. So busy on the national as well as, um, you know, certainly the state and industry forefront for many years. Yeah, well, and talk about changes. We're going to be doing a podcast, um, a year in review it's probably going to be in early 2024. So depending on when this comes out, it might not be in order. But I, I was saying to my team, I was like, we need to put together a chart of all of the changes because my head is spinning. And I think there's like, there might be like 12 or 14 different regulatory changes that have happened. And so much of it is like on the enrollment side, which obviously can have some interface with what you do at CHAP. And so excited to learn what is it like being a chef like what are your days doing because <laughs> you're not obviously a surveyor you're heading up uh, you know accreditation so I'd imagine that's both working with your survey teams but also CMS you have a contract with CMS and all that stuff so so tell me a little bit about your days and what it is and is it like what you thought it was going to be like or Absolutely. I will say that it's actually even better than I and, and imagine that it would be. Um, I have worked very closely with CHAP um, as an AO for accrediting organization for many years, as long as I have been alongside CHAP in my survey roles. Um, but now in this role as VP of accreditation, I'm responsible for all accreditation or survey activity. So all of the surveyors, we call them site visitors, all of our accreditation decisions, and operations um, do I they they do report and work directly with me. Um, I work alongside, yeah, Dr. Jennifer Kennedy. You may remember. Yeah, her. of course. 
Um, she does say hello. And yeah. she is, um, she's my counterpart. She's the vice president of quality and standards. So between both of us and then Teresa Harbour, who's our chief operating officer, we really manage all of the day-to-day um, requirements, if you will, for for uh, home health hospice, home infusion, and demi post. We are a deemed a CMS deemed accrediting organization. What that means is we can provide or conduct those surveys on behalf of CMS in lieu of a state survey agency. So I was going to sort of jump in. And so that's obviously a a really big role, lots of different (laughs) provider types in there. Um, And I guess in terms of your interfacing with CMS, mm-hmm. right? So they're giving, and I'm thinking, I feel like CHAP has been, are they the longest standing hospice accrediting organization? Yes, we are. We are the, the, we were the first home health and hospice accrediting organization in the U.S. over 55 years ago. And it's not just the CMS deemed um, sur- site, uh, surveys that we perform. We also um, perform non-Medicare certified home care agency surveys. Oh, you do? Okay. Li- yep. Licensures for states, for several states, including um, Wisconsin, by the way. And, um, and also we have uh, f- accreditation for pharmacy, palliative care, and then certifications in disease management, such as dementia and age-friendly care. So there's a lot more um, than our CMS responsibilities. However, our CMS team responsibilities are certainly um, our uh, top priority in terms of making sure that we have all of our processes in place to meet CMS requirements. And that includes updates that come from CMS to the AOs or to the industry. And and also we receive those notifications from CMS or the MACs, the Medicare Administrative Contractors or state agencies when there are um, substantiated complaint surveys, changes of ownership, change, you know, all of those, yeah. the, the documentation that organizations have to fit in, fill, um, submit, and also when they are approved, right, for their initial CCN. So we, in this role, um, which I have almost daily in, in you know, communication in some for- fashion um, that involves CMS. And, and for that, I'm, I'm actually very, it's very exciting, believe it yeah. believe or not part yeah. of my role, something I have, I, I did, you know, more so in the years um, with the state association, but it really is, um, see, I have to say that the groups that we work with at CMS are very supportive of the AOs and 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 very responsive. So yeah. um, it's, it actually has been a very positive experience. I think everyone's mind is spinning and that I'm sure um, you as well. CMS, I mean, they're, they, the number of changes they came out with in over the last year in response mm-hmm. to a lot of the concerns, which I'd imagine, you know, definitely impacts you since there's a lot of concerns about the types of providers getting certified and questions about how are all these people certified at this one location. And so I'm sure there's a, a lot of, you know, training and education and stuff all around about that. But I was dying to do this podcast with you because I wanted to ask you all of these questions that I find confusing sometimes and that I think, you know, survey and you've been around the block uh, a lot of years too. You know, I I came up doing a lot of nursing home survey work, which is so well developed for a very long time. You had the scope and severity grid, you know, the interpretive guidelines were like a thousand pages. I mean, there was lots of guidance. And then, you know, you go to hospice and I mean, now it's a little bit more well developed, but there's still lots of things that are unwritten, uh, you know, and the place I wanted to jump to first was... Um, and this is maybe my soapbox a little bit, is just this line between condition level citations and standard level citations. And, you know, I was really hopeful when we were doing some of the survey reform that would there would be greater clarity all around about when, because I guess from my perspective, and I, I'm sure you maybe saw this as a consultant too, is sometimes you're 
there's not a lot of rhyme or reason. Like, I sort of think like, well, you should get a, a condition level if, you know, there was actual harm and it was serious or the p- potential harm was very serious. But sometimes I see not a lot of rhyme or reason to it. And we obviously don't have clear guidance that says like the scope and severity grid you have for nursing homes, like this is when you're going to get an E-level citation or whatever. But tell me like how... CMS views that and how you view that and how you educate around that? Because I think that that's a really important question as we think about all of the survey reform and penalties now that can be attached to certain things that that's really important. Well, certainly, as you pointed out, I have a lot of experience prior to CHAP, but I can tell you that um, our processes with CHAP in, in CHAP are very thorough. We have to start with first that all of the site surveyors, we call them site visitors, um, are tra- QCEP trained, so they receive CMS training. Um, and, and that is the same for the other um, accrediting organizations as well that I believe, as well as the state survey agencies are also um, supposed to have that training done as well. We also have, in addition to, to thorough training, we have a really a two-level review process. I can only speak to our chat process. When, site visit, when the findings are submitted by the surveyor, they are reviewed internally by our internal team, and then we also have a board of review. So before, um, and that sometimes will go after a plan of correction, but there's also, there's a lot of discussion and decision before findings are, you know, are finalized. And the criteria, you are right. I mean, with the exception of immediate jeopardy, which of course has um, Appendix Q with the triggers, yeah. Um, the the different the really the the differentiator, and I go back to the word scope and severity as well. And yeah. So you know, is really whether there's an actual or potential severe or critical patient health or safety breach. You can have a situation where there are a number of standards under a condition or elements under a standard that you know combined may rise to a condition, but more often than not. It's really about the impact of those findings and potential impact on the, of those findings on qual, uh, safe and quality patient care. An example is um, a hospice aid. Um, you may have several, you know, uh, you may have a few items, right? A tags out on a hospice aid for not following the plan of care, but it may be related to not changing the bed or not, mm-hmm. you know, brushing the patient's hair or, you um, or, um, you know, most of the aid is competent, but the sur- survey uh, 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 supervisions may not always occur. That may be looked at differently. And I'm not saying every time, but I'm just using mm-hmm. that as an yeah, example. Yeah. And a, then a hospice aid that was did not have evidence of training and competency. There were there was no supervision, and and the items on the plan of care that they the, the aid care plan that they were missing were things like safe patient transfer, you know, bathing the patient, the patient is on oxygen, or the patient's bed bound and has a risk for skin breakdown or a wound. So you really have to look at at the you know all of the aspects um, before you can make that decision. And like I said, I can speak for CHAP. We have uh, an oversight process that we really do make sure that if we're citing at a condition, um, and certainly at an IJ, but at a condition, um, that that those are also thoroughly reviewed. So we take we take that our responsibility very seriously. I guess on that front, because you know that that's sort of how I but see it too. And if I were in your shoes, I mean, Mm -hmm. it shouldn't just be like, oh, you had a number of standards out that automatically means a condition level, right? It's like, how serious is whatever deficiency we're talking about and potential or actual harm, which I think is important because where I wanted to turn our attention to was about advocacy, right? So you did this a lot as a consultant and it's what we do as lawyers is, and, and I think is so critical when we talk about survey management. And I think it's something that, um, you know, as opposed to when we talk about government audits, where it's like nameless, faceless person who's looking at records, 
like you do have an opportunity with your site visitors to have a conversation or as you said, there, and we can talk about this a little bit more about the appeal process that CHAP has and things like that, but but having a conversation about um, if you have cons- some concerns as a provider, I think the first thing isn't just, I disagree, right? Like, well, but why? And that's why I guess getting this out on the table about things that are important when you're having a conversation, like I'm not understanding where you're coming from. I think a scope and severity is a good place to start. But what are aspects of good survey management? Maybe let's go there for a second, because obviously that's a lot what you did in your role as a consultant about how to stay prepared, but also how to navigate a survey that might not be going that well, right? And you don't throw in the towel. How do you, you know, keep good lines of communication open and keep you know, it's critical that there's trust, you know, that Mm -hmm. both ways, like, if I bring something up, the the survey or site visitor is going to listen. And not that you always agree, but I think that mutuality of I'll listen to what you have to say. And likewise, so, so tell me a little bit about, you know, good survey management, if a survey isn't going well, what do you do? You know, those kinds of things. Well, first and foremost, I would say that um, what I hear most often from 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 our customers, our providers, is that a, 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 the hallmark of CHAP is that we are edu- our approach is educational. So we we do our site visitors are you know very thorough. They're um, they're very communicative. We just I just had an example today of an organization that was very complimentary of the guidance, not just the guide, you know, not just okay, this is what you need to do for the service. But overall, you know, helping them to understand what the regulation is. Um, Ultimately, it is the organization's responsibility to be able to demonstrate how they meet the standard. So first and foremost, having a thorough understanding of the regulations before the survey occurs and then being able to demonstrate at least in our case, our standards very closely mirror the COP. So we don't have a lot of extra. Um, we don't put the interpretive guidelines, for example, in our standards. So if you're clear with the standards and you can demonstrate how you meet the standard, then that's where the conversation starts. We also have, um, again, a, a process very similar to a state survey where if there is a question, the site visitor does call into a signed director for the that particular provider. So there's that ongoing, you know, relationship and communication. Um, so that part of it is it, of survey management is really understanding the regs and how how the how the agency shows that they meet the standards, and then really being um, on top of the both all of those for hospice appendix M changes. All of, I call it all, all of the red in Appendix M, all of the pre-survey guidance that's there, all of the really detailed information regarding, um, you know, what clinical records to review, examples of interviews and document review and approach to survey for all aspects um, Mm -hmm. of hospice is vitally important. We can't, I can't, you can't underestimate the um, the 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 benefit of having a true proactive survey management process because that helps all of the staff, especially the staff in the field, who are you know draw the lucky card and they are yeah. making they're you know, making the survey. And I I want to just add here that. Um, Again, we also are, as a deeming agency, we are surveyed by CMS. Um, and as an example, we recently had our home health deeming application survey. We had no findings. So wow. what that says is CMS said to us, um, you know, that our documentation, um, you know, regarding uh, the principles of documentation, the appropriateness of the level of findings, um, and they looked at everything, site visits, plans of correction, 
or policies. They they looked at a, a lot, and they went on a home on a on an on an actual site visit, and um, they were you know that just to me it makes certainly me very proud, but yeah. very proud. That's 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 validation of the work you know that we're doing. Also, CMS has just started in November resumed validation surveys, which are different than what we were used to. So they're they're called Dove surveys, direct observation validation surveys. Um, CMS contractors are going out with the the AO. Um, um, surveyors and observing. It's okay. not a separate survey. It's not going to be two sets of findings. And it's they are not uh, conducting the survey. They are observing our site, our surveyors. And um, so it just started in November. And uh, and right now it is uh, announced to the AO to CHAP. So we know ahead of time. Uh, agencies do not because, of course, our surveys are unannounced. Yeah. But very soon, within the next six months, even we will not know when they're coming. So, you know, that that and that is fairly frequent that it's happening now. So uh, so, again, we have all of that oversight um, in helping us to make sure that we have processes in place, you know, to to in to support our approach and our decision making in survey. So tell me this, where do where do providers go wrong? Like when when surveys go real south, which I'm sure you've seen uh, your fair share, um, even in the time you've been with CHAP, like what's the don't do this list of things people do, you know, not not substantively so much, but like you know, we know what probably good survey management is and stuff, but where do things just break down and what do people do? Because this is humans dealing with other humans and stress. And because I, I do think there's just things that that folks can do, I'd imagine, that just mm-hmm. get things on the wrong foot and it's hard to ever get it on the right foot. So can you just give give our listeners some of those things of what not to do? Sure. Um, And I I will call these couple of items low-hanging fruit. Um, And especially with the spotlight, as we know, that are on some states um, related to um, hospice, in particular hospice operations, number one, they need to make sure that if they are an operating hospice, or or any agency that they uh, have an office, they have an office, they have people in the office, they have availability of an administrator, an alternate, the medical director, clinical leadership, and staff. It is interesting to see that there are times when an organization may have posted hours and yet there's the staff are not available. That's the first and foremost thing, because if we can't gain entry into a survey or can't complete the survey, we 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 have to notify CMS. Um, the second is really just making sure CMS is notified and and CHAP in our case of time of any changes, changes in location, ownership you know, key leadership and make sure that all new staff and managers are involved in survey readiness and implementation. We've had examples of even larger organizations, which we have um, wonderful relationships with what we call our corporates. Um, And just they have a great most of the time there's a very strong corporate structure, but just making sure that the local the local um, office has also that training and they understand you know, their role and responsibility in survey. And, you know, just from a survey management standpoint, you've heard me say, I'm sure many times, keep a survey readiness book online and in each location and to facilitate timely provision of reports, whether it's a census report, you know, schedules, the documents, um, because that that's a, a personnel record list, you know, HR list, just things like that, that inevitably you know, any delays just causes, you know, more stress on the survey. As far as the survey itself, you know, um, they just, you know, really 
I can't stress enough how much practice, practice, practice. So that means those mock surveys with your field staff, because they are really, <laughs> you know, they, they're the most vulnerable in terms of, of really, uh, you know, you know, first of all, being really nervous and then potentially saying or doing something just because they're, they're, they're scared. They're, they're nervous, you know, hand hygiene or, you know, answering a question, you know, uh, you know, completely wrong or providing a lot of information that really the surveyor doesn't, you know, necessarily need to have. Um, and also remember that surveys can happen at any time and substantiated complaint surveys along with condition level findings and IJ serve, uh, are components of potential inclusion for the SFP. So they really have to make sure that they have a tight complaint process, you know, um, and a follow-up with their QAPI programs and monitoring their hospice quality reporting. So all of those components, uh, they really, they, the agency really needs to have a process in place um, to be able to know how they are addressing them ongoing. Another new acronym, SFP, it does not roll off my tongue, but special focus program when you're talking about IJs and condition level and substantiated complaints, which again, one of the many, many changes that we're seeing and how that will actually play out is going to be interesting over time. I mean, I just think the stakes on surveys is just so much greater. Um, Obviously, we can get civil monetary penalties and we can, um, you know, have the manager, outside manager signed an owl payment for new admissions. I mean, all of this stuff. I mean, if you weren't taking it seriously before, I mean, it's the ramifications of this are just really significant and can really have money problems too, because the denial of payment for new admissions for hospice is a huge deal because our length of stay is really short. So if that's in place, I mean, so much of our census turns over every single month. So if you have a denial of payment for new admissions, like for a nursing home, the number of Medicare patients that, you know, new patients are getting might not be, you know, the same volume we're dealing with. So these are really significant Another significant thing that happens as we sort of wind down here that is not new, but I think it has some logistical things that just I think would be helpful um, for you to explain about when someone who has deemed status get like they lose their deemed status and they go to the state survey authority and what does that actually mean? How does that happen? How do you get back to the AO? And can you explain a little bit? That's typically I've run into it when you have a condition level citation and then, but why don't you tell me more of the story about how that works? Sure. Well, um, when an organization has um, typically substantiated complaints with the con with condition level deficiencies it may not be just a condition level deficiency it may be that they've had condition level deficiencies that were then not re um, rectified if you will you know within the 45 days it really depends yep. on the circumstance IJ for sure immediate jeopardy um, in those cases um, or if a state conducts a complaint survey and identifies a substantiated complaint what happens is the agency is notified that their deemed status is um, is not is is no longer is temporarily removed uh, what that means is that the hospice still has they um, still has their CCN they still have their provider number they can still admit patients and uh, unless, you know, without any enforcement yeah. remedies, they can still bill. They don't lose their billing privileges because a lot of times there's that some confusion there um, and it is redeemed or they they are able to be reinstated as an a of as a deemed accredited organization when the condition levels um, that they have clearing of their condition levels or their immediate jeopardy. So there's a process where CMS and actually notifies the agency of the removal of their deemed status. Um, and then the reinstatement, it says deemed status is maintained. So, you know, again, um, we monitor those 
you know, with um, organizations. And we have an obligation to report to CMS all of our survey findings, and then CMS will notify the agencies. So then that revisit that has to happen to get back into deemed status, then does the state do that then? Or do it depends. You... Again, okay. if it's a if it's a regular condition clearing, you know, under normal circumstances, if we have just condition level deficiencies, it doesn't automatically revert to the state. I always thought that it did, but it does not. We do condition clearing visits, and then we notify CMS. Um, the way we see deemed status removed is typically if um, there's an IJ or a state. Uh, substantiate a complaint survey with condition level deficiencies. Uh, and in which case we see the, the trail, we see the communication to the provider. We Got see it. when that survey was done, but nine times out of 10, we do that. Sometimes if we have a situation where we were not able to gain entry into an agency, um, then um, we notify the, the CMS and then their accreditation is temporarily terminated, but they are or terminated, but they 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 still maintain their provider number. So they they then also refer to the state agency. So it's it's a little bit complicated, but I think the biggest, you know, there's a lot of nuances, if you will. Yeah. So, but the 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 biggest lesson is that just because deemed status is, um, you know, is temporarily removed, um, it doesn't mean that the, that the provider number is removed. And then that revisit survey. So let's say they, they say your deemed status is temporarily removed. Obviously, you're going to need a revisit to get back into substantial compliance, I'd imagine, typically. Like, so who yeah. does that? Do you does the AO Again. not do that? It depends if if, if oh, deem okay. status has if the, if the deem status has not been removed under most cases where we have condition level deficiencies right yeah. even IJ will go and do the re, the will do the return visit and then and and then we report that to CMS and that is cleared um, there are just times when the state has then determined that they are going to um, oh, you know okay. go out and do a visit sometimes. If we if we report to CMS our findings, especially if it's a complaint um, and the state has also received a complaint, there may be a, a second survey by the state agency. Oh, so, got it. so it's not an automatic that a condition level deficiency or even an IJ automatically means that it reverts to the state. There really is a CMS determination. We most often will conduct those surveys and get the and get the and and work to to um, get the agency back into compliance, right? So they can demonstrate it. But you yeah. know, and we've had that experience where um, we've got, you know, gone out close to the deadline, right? Close to 23 days yeah. or close to the 90 days, even after the 45 days. And it's at, at that point, um, you know, First of all, at that point, um, certainly as a consultant, we used to say, make sure you have a, a hospice experienced lawyer yeah. Yeah. <laughs> to help you. Uh, and um, and uh, also, you know, and even in this, you know, also making sure that they have certified consultants in some cases. But, you know, it's it it's it's a little bit complex. Like I said, it's not cut and dry. But yeah. generally speaking, if if if. If deem status is removed, it typically can revert back under, you know, once the state has cleared them, you know, if it's been a complaint, a state driven complaint, or there are some cases where the organization has to reapply for accreditation. So, um, but it's, you know, it, it's, it's, it's not something that has to be permanent. So the last thing I wanted to cover, which sort of dovetails on some of the stuff, which I think um, is an area that we as an industry need to get way better at, which is writing plans of correction. Um, I, I am sure you saw this all the time when you're a consultant. You still see this all the time where people either write too much or too little, you overpromise, you underdeliver, like, you know, people just don't hit the right tone. Like, it's really like, 
the who, what, where, why, when, how in short form, right? Like who's going to make sure this is going to happen? You know, when is this going to be done? How are you going to, you know, measure this or, you know, whatever it may be. I, I still just think people really struggle with writing effective plans of correction because, um, you know, one thing I, I see again in the do not do list is don't over promise. You can do more than you're, you say you're going to do in your plan of correction. You don't need to write it in there, right? If you want to do something, but the worst you can do is say you're shooting for the moon and, you know, and then you get a fail revisit because you didn't do what you said you were going to do. And it's like, you don't get extra credit for saying you're, you're going to do more. So I think stick to, to sort of what is actually needed, not like the gold, gold star or triple gold star or whatever. Um, I see that a lot, but I guess what's on your sort of top, top five list of like what people do wrong in plans of correction? Well, again, I'm, I'm leaning on all of my experience when I respond to this. First and foremost, they need to make the plan of correction measurable and achievable, exactly what you said. You want to make sure that it makes sense for the organization to address, you know, the, the finding, uh, you know, identify what they're doing for monitoring and follow up, but make sure it's, it's achievable. Also, making sure that the monitoring is um, it has an end point when, you know, because sometimes we'll see plans of correction that look as though they're going to continue on with a hundred percent audit in perpetuity. And, you know, so you want to have a threshold, you want to have, you know, a self-defined, um, tapering down, if you will, um, you know, once thresholds are met and then incorporate it into your organization organization's copy program, whatever the routine quality monitoring program. So, you know, you don't have uh, really a, an untenable plan of correction. However, you do have to, they do have to make sure that there's oversight of that plan of correction to make sure it is implemented as noted because previous deficiencies may be taken into account if there are still issues. And remember with the survey changes, if there are findings same findings across multiple providers. If you have a larger organization, oh. multiple CCNs, we, we look for, for trends. Um, you know, and we are able to do that. We, we definitely do it. And, and, and any survey agency will look at prior survey information yeah. as well. And, and if, you know, if, for example, individualized care planning was uh, uh because that seems to be the top you know <laughs> the top finding yeah. um if that if you had this great robust plan of correction and you completed it and you had a condition we'll just say for you know for for uh you know for the um for that citation and then or for that condition and, you know, the uh, surveyor comes out 45 day clearing, right? You do everything you're supposed to do. And the minute the surveyor leaves, you put it on a shelf and yeah. never look at it again. So then a complaint resurvey, right, three years later, or a complaint survey six months later, and we still have the issue, that's the kind of thing that organizations really need to make sure that it is reasonable, but that they can maintain that monitoring and hold staff accountable, all staff, for not just regulatory compliance, but for their responsibility in, you know, implementation of the plan of correction. And I, we also recommend, I always have recommended utilizing hospice experience consultants and in some cases legal counsel to address any ongoing or serious findings, you know, especially if enforcement remedies are being considered because there's a not, there's, there are many hospices that are, there are many ho wonderful hospices. Most hospices, I will say, are wonderful and they really do strive to you know, to 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 meet the highest standard. There are many hospices that are newer that may not have experienced staff or leadership or have had changes, and they really need to have that expertise to help guide them. Um, you know, um, to be able to make sure that they are successful long after the survey. You know, the survey completes. Yeah. Well. Right. 
the plan of correction is not a piece of paper. Compliance is not a person, right? <laughs> Compliance right. is a organizational yeah. um, responsibility. The plan of mm-hmm. correction is a living, breathing thing that, um, you know, you don't need to get an A plus. You need to get through, and you can do A plus, but don't write it down, right? That do, do something that you can actually accomplish. Because the I just see people, I guess, get sidetracked by doing more than is required, and therefore they don't end up meeting what they actually needed to do to get out of it, and so then they right. fail to revisit and. And people won't know that the uh, we actually do this so we can see each other. And Kim's shaking her head and like, yeah, because it's like, how often have we seen that where it's like, gosh, you don't need to promise the moon. And so it sounds like you're in agreement with me as just well, people get just sort of they almost overreact to stuff like, oh, I got to show I'm taking this seriously. It comes from a good place, but actually you only have so much energy and so much time. And that's why it's like you need someone who's skilled at looking at what is the essential part of what we need to do and then start there <laughs> and do that. And, and, and not, yeah, start by not missing the mark, but then making sure that, again, it's a reasonable, sustainable plan of correction. Now, I will say that, you know, they have a plan of correction does, at least the first part, always needs to be implemented within a, you know, a, a relatively short period yeah. of time. But um, but again, it's that sustainability, you know, um, that that becomes that that really is what the organization needs, because ultimately that's really the goal is, you know, the, the survey, it's the responsibility of everybody in the organization. And with this, you know, increased scrutiny organizations need to make sure that they, you know, have, have processes in place that they, you know, have reasonable monitoring ongoing. Yeah. Well, I was, part of me was sad when you left consulting because you (laughs) um, have been so helpful to me and clients over the years because I think, you know, Lawyers can be great, but I also think lawyers are not the best in terms of implementing. Like, I'm not a clinician. I mean, I've been around this long enough that I can do that stuff. But I just think if you are struggling, really having a consultant that can help be your guide. And I also think it signals to the accrediting body, like, hey, I'm taking this seriously and yourself identifying like I need some help because I I do think, you know, there's not a lot of grace in this new system <laughs> that we're facing. And it's pretty, so you don't have like three strikes. I mean, yeah, it's not like you're going to be, we're termination track now immediately, but Right. There's very serious ramifications, even though it's not termination that can happen. And so I just was, you know, sad to lose you as a colleague, as a consultant, as someone when a client's calling me in crisis and thinking like, I need someone that can go and sort of <laughs> speak the language and get things done and all that. But at the same time, you know, it's very cool in your current job and someone that I know brings the wealth of experience that you do and different perspectives because I think you operationally understand what it is to be in a hospice. So hopefully in terms of you know, providers having conversations, you understand. It doesn't mean you always agree, but I think probably the thing that can be most frustrating for providers is they just don't get it. Like I'm talking to someone who just never has done this. They don't know. Mm -hmm. And that feels bad, right? I mean, and so it, again, it doesn't mean like, oh, Kim's going to make different decisions because, you know, there's no favorites here, but I think that I was, I felt warm hearted though, when you had this position, cause I, I felt like you're a great person to, I never really thought we'd have someone like you in <laughs> that position. Cause I just think 
if I had to pick up the phone and call you about something, I feel like you'd understand where I'm coming from. And we might not, you know, agree, but like you're hearing me out. And I also think you bring a level of I real world experience. It's not like I read a book and this is what it said, you know, and I think that that's what in terms of trust in the process that I think is really helpful. And I think it's something that if you do um, have deemed status and you're accredited, I mean, I think there can be a real value to that. And I think, you know, CHAP has been around for a really long time. And, you know, I I just think the fact that you are there (laughs) says something about (laughs) the kind of approach that they have. And I know that, you know, you really, you know, can bring all of your different perspectives to your job. And I think you're a great listener and, you know, a very fair, fair person. Um, and, you know, want to find ways to get through things, you know. And so um, I think that's really important because there are, as you said, there's board review and you have appeal rights and, you know, and so you do listen to what people have to say. And I think that's really important. So so thank you for for being in the role that that you're in, because um, I, I can't imagine that it's it's an easy job. Sometimes it seems like, oh, it must be great to be the regulator. Right. Like, oh, you hold all the cards. But I'm sure it's also very difficult. Well, you know, I, I will say that um, it's. I actually am, um, you know, I, I feel truly honored to be in this role. Um, and I am surrounded not just by all the experts that we talked about before um, within CHAP. Our site visitors all have real world operational experience. So these are not, you know, um, folks that came up through a system and they surveyed in, you know, another setting and they're now in hospice, you know. Um, so really they, they bring profound um, uh, understanding um, and expertise when they are working with the with the organizations. But I do agree with you that in this era of increased CMS scrutiny um, on the survey side, it's it's highly recommended that agencies consider accreditation, certainly CHAP accreditation, because we do have valued. Um, value-added oversight, um, consistency, which is really important, and the educational focus um, for the surveys, as well as ongoing education and programs outside of the survey that can wrap around the hospice and help meet not only regulatory compliance, but also move the hospice forward in, in improving their services and outcomes and their staff knowledge. And ultimately, the goal is to for to be able to support partner with agent organizations to provide safe quality care and you know and really help them to sustain and that's it's it's i enjoy the role of being um you know again yes we are uh, a deeming authority but we really have a uh, um work to be a supportive um supportive to our or our customers so yeah, and to, and to our partners such as you. <laughs> yeah, well, it is important work. And, you know, I think everyone's committed to what this work is, which is compassionate, quality, end of life care. I mean, that's why we're all here, right? So we all want the yeah. same goal. And well, I thank you for for all of the, the work you do. And I'd imagine, you know, lots of learning too, because obviously you've been around the block, but then, you know, all things that your new role, um, I'm sure required you to learn many new things too. So, right. Got to keep learning or else. Learn every day. (laughs) Learn every day. So, well, this is. And CMS will make sure that we do as well. Exactly. Yeah. You know, just when you (laughs) thought you understood everything or most things, then, you know, um, but keeps us young and vital. Kim. There you go. Yes. So, but well, this was delightful, and I really, really appreciate your time, Kim. This was wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much for having me. It's been a pleasure. I I enjoy working with you, and I love um, being able to, uh, you know, help in in providing additional guy uh, education and insight for you know for your listeners. So thank you. Well, that's it for today's episode of Hospice Insights, The Law and Beyond. Thank you for joining the conversation. 
To subscribe to our podcast, visit our website at hushblackwell.com or sign up wherever you get your podcasts. Until next time, may the wind be at your back. Bye.